Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, I am the director of the National Alaska Director of Asian Children's Studies. I would like to welcome you all participants of the uh, seventh final conference of the Society of the Mediterranean. Uh, we're very happy and delighted to have you here. I would like to thank Professor Alexa Clary for organizing this job premises. And uh, I'm sure that uh, you are enjoying the so many conference, but our beautiful staff at home. The Institute for Mediterranean Studies is uh, the uh, not one of the nine institutes of the, uh, the Foundation for Research and Technology, which is a uh, research center. And uh, we pride ourselves in being uh, the best research center in Greece and, uh, and 15th in funding in Europe. Uh, we have, we are the only uh, humanities uh, in, in, in humanities and social sciences, humanities and social sciences. We have 10 research groups, uh, an upcoming uh, research group in uh, ancient and Byzantine worlds, uh, Ottoman uh, history, Ottoman history, the Department of Ottoman history, a global economic history, uh, 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 Cities and the Diaspora, Center of Finance Studies, uh, History of Technology, uh, Center of uh, History of Art, uh, Theatrology, uh, Cinema Studies, and Archaeology and uh, Egyptology, uh, Implies in Archaeology. So we are hosting uh, uh, many uh, foreign research uh, uh, colleagues and uh, we carry out our job to carry out lot of research problems. And we do this in collaboration with the University of Crete, many members of the professors of the Department of History and Archaeology and also the Department of Archaeology are part uh, are members of our institute. So welcome and uh, I'm delighted to be here to listen to your Thank you. So here we are with our keynote today. I'm particularly pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Nukes Baldwick, um, who's an associate professor of history at um, Rogers University, Newark. Um, her research focuses on, very pertinently, on plague um, and disease. Well, her, actually, her first book, Plague and Empire in the Early Modern Mediterranean World, the Ottoman Experience between 1347 and 1600. Some of you might remember got the Ulysses Argus Prize uh, from the Society of Medieval Mediterranean in um, 2017. So it's five years after that, but at least we have been here with us, which is fantastic. Um, so Nuket's research um, is very broad and focuses more generally on Ottoman history and the early modern Mediterranean cultural history, but also obviously the history of medicine and public health um, history. And her work has really covered, as you can see from her, a uh, long list of publications that I'm not going to list here, uh, but the most recent one, which uh, the most people just submitted uh, last week or something like that, is um, about death and disease in the medieval and early modern world, perspective from across the Mediterranean and beyond. Um, she's also involved with uh, the important project of actually making sources uh, uh, broadly available through the Black Death Digital Archive. Um, and she's also worked in close collaboration with the Institute of Advanced Studies at Princeton that has supported actually um, her research. 
She's also served on a number of journals as the editor in chief, actually, of the Journal of the Ottoman and Turkish Study, uh, Studies Association, but also as co editor uh, of Stanford Ottoman Work Series, and so on and so on. I am sure that also some of you might come across uh, indirectly um, uh, with uh, Nuret, in, sorry, Nuret's uh, research in the last couple of years because of the COVID pandemic. And you might have seen her appearing on CNN, the Washington Post, uh, Al Jazeera, the Times, or lots of online lectures that were actually really instructive. So today she's going to give us a glimpse um, of, well, not a glimpse of her research, but in 40 minutes, at least, you know, we can get a chance of really, with her, rethinking about the pandemics of the medieval Mediterranean. And thank you for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Antonella, for this. Very generous introduction. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I'm actually honored uh, to be doing one of the uh, doing one of the keynotes of this conference. And in fact, uh, well, I should thank Antonello once again here for extending me uh, the invitation. Of course, it'll be second hour for taking care of all the logistics and answering all of my questions very patiently. But I would like to emphasize what really is an honor and pleasure to be here today, especially because there was a lot of planning, because a lot of uncertainties going on about when this event was going to take place and uh, whether it was going to be in person, whether it was going to be a hybrid written end, and of course um, postponed and all that. But finally we're here and you know being in person, it's just, it makes me very, very happy. Thank you. So, and of course, the pandemic context, right? Uh, where, you know, I would say the elephant in the room, some of you, some of us are masked, some of us are not, but like really the pandemic makes itself um, as an important uh, presence because it's still with us very, very much. And of course, I'm not gonna go into the, the reasons why we failed miserably as the international community to keep COVID-19 pandemic in check, the fact that more than 6 million people, these are um, the statistics as of this morning, uh, the fact that more than 6 million people lost their life to this pandemic continues to be a sobering truth. My lecture today will rather go into old patterns of thinking about pandemics, past or present, which I think are important to assess why we are where we are today. My hope is thus to underline the relevance of history how we think about past matters in how we understand the present or imagine the future. This I will try to demonstrate using the history of pandemics and discussing their lasting legacy. The focus of this meeting, however, is interruptions and disruptions in the medieval Mediterranean. And in keeping with this theme, the theme I will try to approach these moments of interruptions and disruptions from the perspective of history of pandemics. But here, the medieval Mediterranean is not only a random selection of geographic area. On the contrary, I will try to demonstrate the central or the underscore the centrality of the Mediterranean world for its history. Hence, I hope you will find the discussion not only timely for our present day concerns but also relevant in promoting the critical importance of the medieval Mediterranean and the post-medieval Mediterranean. Now, a little background to start things off. A little bit information background on the history of um, plague pandemics. The medieval Mediterranean experienced a series of epidemic and epidemic diseases, among which were the two most disruptive plague pandemics of the pre-modern world. That is to say, the Justinianic plague and the Black Death pandemics, each initiating this new disease regime of the first and the second pandemics of plague, respectively. Plague is an infectious disease caused by the bacteria Yersinia pestis that attacks the lymph nodes, usually causing inflammation that produces painful swellings in the armpits, neck, and the groin area that are called bubos, the characteristic 
symptom of the disease of the pneumonic uh, plague. In some cases, the bacteria affect the lungs and cause pneumonic plague, which can then be transferred from person to person by infected droplets, spread in the air as a result of coughing or sneezing. Just wanted to give you a very brief background about the biology of the disease, right? Essentially, the world is plague can spill over to humans by infected fleas and cause them to develop a series of infections that can result in severe complications and often death. In its default pneumonic form, mortality is anywhere from 40 to 70 percent, while its pneumonic form it is a fatal condition that can kill within the first 24 hours unless uh, not uh, treated promptly with antibiotics. Contrary to common perception, plague is not an extinct disease. It is very much alive in some parts of the world. Uh, for example, in the Southwest, Southwest United States, parts of Central Asia, and parts of Africa, where it is enzoatic among rodent populations and still sometimes spills over into human populations. If anything, human cases of plague have been recently on the rise. Since 2019, frequent cases of human Bubonic plague, um, the reported from Mongolia, Inner Mongolia, and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Um, if there are any further questions about anything that has to do with the biological um, aspects of plague or the epidemiology, I'd be happy to answer those questions during the discussion. But let me just go back to its history. Just wanted to give you a brief background. So, both the so called first and the second pandemic. As I mentioned before, the one that starts with the, the Justinianic plague or plague of Justinian of the late Antic period, and the other one that starts with the Black Death in the middle of the 14th century and continues throughout the rest of the late medieval and early modern period. These both of these pandemics left a deep imprint in medieval Mediterranean societies, transforming them irreversibly. But how do we study such epidemic episodes of the past? Where is our attention focused and what are our blind spots? And how do we rethink the legacy of past pandemics? In the present age of pandemics, it is critical to rethink how we write that history with a conviction that the past helps us to understand the present and the present should help us to rethink the past. I turn to past plagues and the legacy they left behind and here, just trying to add a little bit of sense of humor, but also showing how even in popular culture, references to plague, especially the Black Death, is something that is very much present in a way to compare every new pandemic in the light of the Black Death, uh, generally referred to as the mother of all pandemics. My presentation takes stock of the lasting legacies of past plagues because they continue to shape the way we think about new pandemics. Here, I will first situate some of the broader historiographical parameters that inform the study of past pandemics in the last few decades. My goal is to stress that the reflexive discussion of past pandemics as short-term cataclysmic events must be replaced by a broader, more realistic vision that recognizes that pandemics are long-term processes. This can only be achieved by adopting a longer, multi-century time scale that facilitates detecting the ebb and flow of disease over the long term. Then I will emphasize that we need to shift our focus beyond epidemic episodes of crisis, disruption, or collapse to better understand how past societies learn to live with diseases and the processes by which they develop the means of resilience and adaptation in facing them. In both cases, the medieval Mediterranean service is an excellent case in point, which with a rich repository of historical experiences. Against this uh, backdrop, I will then turn to lasting legacies of past plagues and address persistent problems such as European exceptionalism, triumphalism, and epidemic, epidemiological orientalism that are not only ubiquitous in the historical scholarship, but also staples, staples of public opinion about pandemics past and present. Let's start with a little background on some of the important recent debates for the history of interruptions and disruption. 
In the last decade or two, pressing global issues such as global warming, environmental degradation, habitat destruction and loss of biodiversity have raised growing concern and led to divisive debate, debates, not only in the public domain and among policymakers, but also among scholars in the natural sciences and humanities alike. One approach that seems to have achieved prominence is the concept of collapse or societal collapse. In 1988, the American anthropologist Joseph Tainter published a book called The Collapse of Complex Societies, which examined three historical societies as case studies. In Tainter's analysis, societal collapse was not only caused by what is typically understood as environmental crisis, such as crop failures, famines, or epidemics, but rather by economic crisis. The concept of collapse or societal collapse stirred important discussions among anthropologists, historians, sociologists, and political scientists. In 2005, the American polymath Jared Diamond publishes book Collapse, How Societies Choose to Fail or Succeed, as a direct response to the concept of societal collapse, in which he emphasized resilience and societal transformation instead. Diamond's book was also criticized, especially by historians and archaeologists, which led some to adopt newer approaches by either rejecting collapse or catastrophe approach, or by developing new frameworks to study that would go beyond these perspectives. Further debates about collapse versus resilience started to become prominent, in fact, recently, especially in, in archaeology, in paleoscience, especially in uh, paleoclimatology and paleopathology. As new research techniques became available to study past societies and new studies reveal closer details of death and destruction caused by environmental and anthropogenic crises, researchers offered a wide spectrum of interpretations ranging from societal collapse to resilience and transformation. Thus, new research came out on the late Bronze Age crisis uh, late Bronze Age collapse, for example, right between uh, 1200 BC and 1150 BC, involving multiple regions across the Mediterranean world, including where we currently are, the island of Crete, right? Uh, as you see on the map, several different locations in the Eastern Mediterranean world have or are supposed to have experienced some form of um, environmental or um, human induced crisis. So um, we see the development of new approaches of, of, of um, thinking about these problems. Similarly, other historical cases, such as the fall of the Roman Empire, for example, or Mesoamerican Maya, Maya civilization or the Angkor civilization of Southeast Asia, have received attention from scholars with different interpretations. Right? Uh, while both collapse and resilience offer novel, novel interpretive frameworks, this binary also divided the scholarship into opposing camps. The division is perhaps nowhere more visible than in pandemic studies, in which you basically need to be in a camp, either collapse or resilience. So I'm, I'm trying to simplify this, but I think it's also uh, true that there is now this, this binary in the field. Recently, um, this, uh, like in pandemic studies, generally speaking, recently became a site or even a battleground for conflicting academic approaches. I will discuss the specifics about the impact of collapse versus resilience in the study of past feminists in a few minutes. But before I do that, I would like to trace back the older forms of pandemic thinking that inform these modern dichotomies which would require taking a quick glance at the 19th century. Not my favorite time period in studying history, but we will have to do that, as this was the beginning of modern historical scholarship on plague pandemics, either where we're talking about the Black Death or basically any other historical pandemic, historical epidemiology starts in the 19th century. The 19th century German medical historian, Frederick Karl Hecker, and his followers established a contours of this body of scholarship on past pandemics. In fact, Hecker himself is uh, the one who coined the term Black Death originally in German, but she also taught that later on uh, translated into English 
and became um, the common term for, for, for this um, historical term. And uh, not only the term that like that, but also the kind of larger Gothic epidemiology that set the rather emotional context, context for these academic narratives. Hecker published his, his uh, Black Death in the 14th century in German, first in 1832. Um, he was a physician at the Frederick Blumman University of Berlin, was interested in all aspects of disease, especially plague, its history, along with its origin, causes, spread, treatment, and how to establish disease as a force in human history. Though not a historian, a medical uh, doctor, a medical writer, but he wanted to establish disease as a force in history. The book was a spectacular success. It was immediately translated into English, and it went through multiple translations that issued into several European languages, Italian, Dutch, French, and whatnot, and then immediately establishing that Hecker as the authority in Europe on historical epidemiology, and many other authors kind of did the following in his uh, footsteps and kind of accepting the, the general uh, tone of writing about play and pandemics. So um, Hecker's work and with the ones uh, who followed him as a model transformed the Black Death and the historical epidemiology into a very captivating field of study of historical scholarship for the next, rest of the 19th century and in fact into the 20th century uh, as well. Uh, even the, the success of the term Black Death is in itself a testament to the success. It's a term that became an international term. Just go on Wikipedia, pull up every single language that uses this term, Black Death, even though it's not a contemporary term, it's not a medieval term. It's a 19th century invention, just you know, through um, dispersion of colonial knowledge forms distributed, became the international and universal term. For this disease. But perhaps even more importantly, Hecker's particular treatment of the subject set the emotional tone for almost all labor historical scholarship on the Black Death. I did some work on uh, why the Black Death is, is Black and the, the, um, how that terminology um, became mainstream. But here, I'd like to say a few things on the broader intellectual context that informed Hecker's work um, that needs to be sought in 19th century European Romanticism. This was a time when academic history just started to develop professionally sort of writing history, especially pioneered by German universities, and many of the examples produced during this period adopted a romantic approach to history, right? In particular, these works share in common a tendency to glorify the past, to employ emotions and a fair degree of individualism, even heroism in historical narratives, in fact, leading to the great man approach in history, as we all know. Beyond this intellectual context, the most immediate historical factor that informed Hecker's work was the global color pandemic that first hit Europe in the 1830s. In the decades that followed, outbreaks of cholera have repeatedly affected Europe, much like the rest of the world, and caused a great number of deaths. It was not long before cholera's spread was understood to be associated with water, which is to say, starting in the second half of the 19th century, not the 15th, uh, 1850s. It was um, this, the, when the uh, association of the disease with water became clear, this made sanitation the main focus of discussion about epidemics uh, in, in, Europe, in Europe. But this was also a time when epidemiological and sanitary anxieties intensified, intensified everywhere in Europe with ramifications in medicine and policy making pertaining to public health, border control, and the like. But this is also the beginning of the, the rise of sanitation and health um, as, as, as a marker of the superior of European civilization, right? Let's just keep this in mind as a background. Um, other medical authors of the 19th and early 20th centuries developed basic, the basic tenets of historical epidemiology and helped lay the foundations of this burgeoning field of modern scientific epidemiology. I was first, and Charles Craig being among the important examples of the late 19th and later of the early 20th century. 
in the historical play narrative that um, that emerged from the writings of Mecker and, and his followers, play specifically and pandemic disease generally was seen as a force of nature that shaped society. So I try to give you that long background about you know discussing or introducing the 19th century historical epidemiology, just to be able to make the point that there is a certain narrative that was developed during that time. And unfortunately, I think it's something that is still very much with us. These uh, scholars essentially promoted the idea of environmental determinism, right? Disease is a force of nature that shapes societies. The Gothic tenor, the stress on death, disease, destruction, and despair, attributing a greater agency to disease in history and a diminished one, a rather small one, to humans. So favoring the agency of the disease over the agency of the humans. Imagining disease as an alien, mysterious, almost unexplainable, nearly supernatural force on human society, even one that has power to determine their fate, always for the first, leading to catastrophic scenarios. This is very overpowering. Um, in these uh, 19th century works. Hecker emphasized the morbid and bizarre aspects of the Black Death, exclusive to Western Europe, in particular, the flagellant movements or the Jewish pogroms, right? Uh, what is, of course, fascinating that these were rather, um, they were not universal phenomena. They uh, were specific to the European context. But the way history was written, the way past pandemics were written, they almost wanted to universalize the, the bizarre on, on that supernatural phenomena. This obsession with morbid and bizarre aspects of history, in line with the 19th century imagination of medieval history, right? So medievalism, think about their imagination of medieval history uh, during this time period. Past is a foreign country. So make uh, whatever you want to make of it. So images of, for example, the dance macabre, the dance of the dead individuals from all walks of life are depicted as coming together to dance, similar you know, allegorical references to death, the closeness of the hour of death and elaborate descriptions of death can be found equally commonly in literary and historical works, poetry, the geographies of, of the medieval period. So these are already the cultural products of the medieval periods, as we know, that Hecker and other historical epidemiologists selectively uh, adopted a certain fascination with them, as illustrated in Hecker's Gothic epidemiology, seems to be reminiscent of the robust European tradition of writing about that since the time of the Black Death. This Gothic epidemiology, though seemingly less prominent today than it was in the 19th century and early 20th century, still defines both scholarly and popular understandings of plague. Historical scholarship, textbooks, and works for the general public on the Black Death are still represented to a large extent by iconic imagery of Gothic epidemiology, the dance macabre, images of the Grim Reaper, or iconic image of the plague doctor. Right. In fact, ironically, it's not even a medieval phenomenon, the, the plague doctor in the 17th century introduction. But just open any textbook, play textbook, or even just you know Google, or you know I see this a lot in students' uh, papers. So these are associated in the public imagination with the Black Death because it's not a contemporary um, not the Black Death. So these have become staples of Black Death imagery. The historical imagination positioned past pandemics as short-term cataclysmic mysterious events that we have no control over. This is certainly recognizable to many of us in this room today, as this was how the COVID-19 pandemic was first understood in, in popular um, media and in public debates. It's definitely not supported by scientific thinking, as emerging infectious diseases and pandemics are preventable phenomena. In the popular imagination, pandemics are often regarded as this like short-term cataclysmic event, catastrophe, uh, metaphors, and isolated exceptional bursts that last no longer than a few months or years. In fact, that was the wishful thinking in the beginning of the pandemic 
from many world leaders. So let me just go away from this all miraculous place here. So I just you know wanted to make sure that we understand the deeper historical context that shape these um, discourses. Um, also, I think it's important to think of the impact of the disaster studies uh, on pandemic thinking. Disaster studies looking at volcanoes, earthquakes, tornadoes, and tsunamis have always focused on short-term cataclysmic events of these phenomena, but in the case of pandemics, we need to adopt a long-term thinking. Especially in popular books, films, and media, pandemics are depicted as freak accidents of nature. Right, in which humans are the ultimate victims, almost apocalyptic phenomena to act, to a touch of sensationalism that are even shown as mysterious diseases that inevitably destroy human societies, inspiring fantasies of post-apocalyptic futures and zombie movies and whatnot. Sadly, this particular imagination of pandemics, whole style, style or not, is the predominant impression among the general public. Pandemics are depicted as apocalyptic almost um, phenomena, but brief episodes, right? As like pan pandemic movies uh, being just some of the examples, but it's a brief episode. It will come and go. That's kind of the message underlying um, underlying message. And of course, this line of thinking easily gives way to denial, right? If you know that it's just you know beyond your control, it will come and go. So you can either just go into denial or just not take the right uh, public or precautions. But pandemics will play as products of a Eurocentric historiography that we uh, need to pay attention to, especially in the case of the Black Death. This is very um, the prevailing sense that if um, the Black Death pandemic and um, other Black pandemics are phenomena. Uh, that should be understood in the context of the European history. And these are, of course, these, these uh, historical narratives are very heavily viewed with legacies of colonialism and, and Orientalism. In the spirit of what I call epidemiological Orientalism, that is to say, the totality of discursive practices whereby Western Europeans viewed, experienced, imagined, reproduced, and presented the Oriental hellscape as the perennially plague stricken other, European epidemiologists continue to imagine plague as an oriental disease and the Orient as the source of the Black Death and by extension, all past plagues. Hecker wrote, Doubtless, it is the nature which has done the most to banish oriental plague from Western Europe, where the increasing cultivation of the herb and the advancing order in civilized society prevented it from remaining domesticated, which is most probably had been in the most more ancient times. In this teleology, the Black Death becomes a twist of fate, a challenge to be overcome by European society and hence celebrated as an integral to its history and civilizational supremacy. In the words of 20th century medievalist David Burlingame, Plague presented a multifarious challenge to European society, but, and I quote, it also prepared the world to renew. Europe proved to be a strong patient and emerged from this long bout with pestilence, healthier, more energetic, and more creative than ever before, end quote. And in fact, it's not unusual to find historical interpretations of the Black Death as something that improved European society. I should also add that despite the influence of this 19th century historiographical approaches, there were also um, important counter narratives that developed, um, especially in the 20th century, especially uh, toward the end of the 20th century. This was also a time, of course, late uh, uh, from the 1970s on, this was a time that witnessed dramatic expansion of historical research that saw not only to cover the lives of ordinary people, peasants, workers, women, and marginalized groups, but also recognize the significance of their suffering, diseases, and deaths. 
These new sensibilities in history, largely powered by the influence of the Amnal school, helped historians foster an interest in play and other diseases. The novel emphasis on the environment and the long delay were heavily influential in shaping play historiography during or starting in the 1970s. New research in the history of disease publications was pioneered by historians such as Amnoya Dabalibuli, William McNeil, Albert Cosby, Albert Cosby, Jacques Hugo, Mohamed and other who wrote foundational studies. The works of these historians not only established disease as just as a legitimate factor in historical studies, meriting academic study for its own sake, for its own sake, but also opened up the possibilities for their exploration in trans-regional, hemispheric, and global contexts. And here I think I should emphasize that it's like the pendulum swings from the, the attributed greater agency to disease in the 19th century with this classical um, historical epidemiological part that I have talked about earlier with Hecker and his followers in the 20th century, especially in the second half of it. And in fact, in the 20th century, now we have greater emphasis on human agency, that is to say, resilience of societies and transformation. But it's kind of a binary that still continues for a long time. Studies on the history of plague and other epidemic diseases began to grow exponentially in the following decades in, in, in the uh, late uh, 20th century into the 21st century. But the medieval Mediterranean has been an important area of focus for these studies but also the primary site for historiographical contentions. Much ink has been spilled on the regions of theological experiences, and yet the legacy of the scholarship produced an epistemologically divided Mediterranean. So when you look at studies on the medieval Mediterranean and early modern uh, Mediterranean with respect to history of plague and pandemics, you see that European Mediterranean is being treated differently than Islamic Mediterranean, just to, to simplify that um, divided epidemiological scene. So critical to point out the toxic legacy that informs our historical thinking about past pandemics so that we can identify its lasting effects, this divided Mediterranean. Plague and the manner in which it was experienced can serve as a lens to unite the divided geographies of the Mediterranean world. The play scholarship of the Mediterranean world is hardly a cohesive subfield. It covers the last 1500 years of place recorded history from the late Antique period to the modern period. With respect to geographical areas, it examines outbreaks of the larger Mediterranean world, even extending to the Black Sea and the Red Sea, Red sea to the, all the way to the Persian Gulf, that um, area, and um, contributed to by a number of experts, even um, outside of history. In the ethnologists, art historians, uh, paleogeneticists, and whatnot. And in fact, it's kind of more divided along the lines of uh, the heritage of academic study and expertise and language and theological expertise rather than disease as being the primary um, driver of this divided uh, academic scene. Especially the Islamic world and Europe, sitting on both ends of this um, the Mediterranean world, situated geographically on, on both ends, but meeting and overlapping in places. These two entities were imagined as regions whose epidemiological experiences were radically different from another. So uh, historians, again, starting um, in the late 20th century, wanted to develop trans-regional perspectives. And in fact, for the first time, Mediterranean is really the center for understanding the history of plague and other diseases, and all these trans-regional connections are being explored. But you still see the legacy of the older Orientalist ways of thinking, and historians looking at the European plague as being separate that play in this market world, which is, of course, a major historiographical problem, right? Thinking of these as uh, the thinking of the Mediterranean, the larger Mediterranean world, as a divided epidemiological system. One end is separate from the other, right? In this historiography. But in reality, we know that these regions represent a unified disease pool, right? The larger Mediterranean world, which inherently included the Islamic world, 
function not only as a sphere of shared epidemiological environment, shared diseases, but also a shared intellectual space. The entire region was heir to a shared body of knowledge since antiquity about how to respond to disease, how to treat diseases. So both in terms of shared microbes and also for um, shared medical uh, traditions, it's a unified region that we study as divided um, entities. So having um, discussed the, the Black Death historiography, I would like to say a few things on um, the late antique uh, plague pandemic, the first pandemic, just the antique plague or, or the plague of Justinian. Um, it's usually called the first pandemic, but it's actually a wrong term. Um, let's just call it the, the first historically documented pandemic of plague. We know that there were um, other uh, pandemics of, of plague before that. But in terms of the time frame, at least the, kind of the conventional, the accepted time frame, we're talking about 541, 542, beginning the, um, the plague of Justinian, and then for the next two centuries, you have recurrent waves of the first pandemic, right? Until uh, the middle of the eighth century. So um, the full spatial and temporal extent of the first pandemic is still under debate. Um, in, in the scholarship, historians still talking about it, and also the roots of spread, its, its emergence, its disappearance, or disappearance are also themes that are being uh, discussed. Perhaps the most important discussion, though, which is very relevant to, to our purposes here, is its uh, impact, its demographic, social, and economic impact. Very contentious. The first pandemic has been the subject of many historical studies since the 1970s and 80s, but most prominently in the last two decades following the confirmation of its causative agent as Yersinia pestis. Let me just clarify that since 2010 or so, we know for a fact that the Black Death was caused by Yersinia pestis, by uh, studies coming from genetics, especially um, uh, pieces of ancient DNA extracted from human teeth being uh, amplified and uh, sequenced in the lab was uh, possible to confirm that the Black Death pandemic was a pandemic of plague uh, caused by the bacteria versus the pestis. This came a little later for the case of the Justinian plague. But we know for a fact today that it was also caused by um, the very same bacteria, right? And uh, this finding this uh, the biological identity of the disease was established and made uh, pandemics research um, open up new possibilities for the expansion of our pandemic research and invited new uh, experts like the archaeologists, paleo geneticists, paleo ecologists, paleo climatologists, along with historians to this, this field of study. And among earlier studies on the first pandemic, although generally divided among the different and usually the conventional lineages of historical scholarship most prominently across Islamicists, right? And looking at texts produced in the Islamic world during the first pandemic, Byzantinists and scholars of the Latin West, right? Uh, even though we're talking about this, the very same pandemic expertise and academic study dividing the histories of the first uh, pandemic. And again, the Mediterranean remains the, the basic um, focal point of the, the geographic attention and essential threat running through these um, historiographies. In recent years, a very bitter controversy started in the field of first pandemic studies, especially about its, its demographic impact, as I said, fueled in part by an emerging revisionist scholarship that calls into question the previous scholarship's assessment of the pandemic's impact the controversy primarily revolves around binary epidemic imaginaries, such as catastrophe versus resilience, or maximalist versus minimalist interpretations of that impact. The controversy is still going on. Uh, every couple of months, we have um, a critique or a response, or response to a response, uh, basically disagreement about how impactful 
bridges in the end of the was right at its return rates, uh, was it indeed a catastrophic blow to late antique society that brought about monumental long term changes or not? Right? Again, in the case of the Black Death, because the lineage of that historiography comes from a different line in the 19th century, we already have the catastrophe theme as a very dominant kind of legacy. Whereas the Justinianic play studies kind of have been influenced uh, by Black Death studies, but now there is this pushback saying, you know, the oldest generation of historians overemphasized the impact of the first pandemic. And in fact, some called it in this new generation, especially in their revisionist uh, scholarship, calling an inconsequential pandemic, perhaps something like the flu, right? Something that was inconsequential. So this, this uh, controversy still, still continues. And, um, and of course, the differences in interpretation of sources, both textual and non-textual, um, the endemic challenge of the dearth of contemporary sources of the late antique period. I mean, this is something that we as historians are very familiar with. These, it seems, are irreconcilable approaches. Uh, it will be very difficult to, to find a middle ground um, in these debates. To overcome the problems of this historiography, historians of the medieval Mediterranean can now turn to study another form of legacy pandemics leave behind. And in fact, not textual sources in this case, not something that we can glean from historical sources, but one that affects population genetics of the Mediterranean to this day. If uh, you want to call it maybe a biological legacy of past pandemics, this is very recent research. <laughs> Just wanted to mention very briefly the recent research that um, revealed that genetic disease, a genetic condition called familial Mediterranean fever, fever maybe familiar to, to some of you here, FMF, originally emerged as a protection from plague. We don't know when, it's, it's caused by a gene, genetic mutation. We don't know when it emerged, but um, as such, FMF is now especially prevalent about, um, in the Eastern Mediterranean, in the Turkish, Armenian, Jewish, and Arab populations in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, it affects, uh, I have some statistics from, from Turkey, it affects one to three people with genetic mutation per thousand people in the Turkish population. But the gene mutation that causes FMF, this disease, occurs is this more, more prevalent, one in six people in Turkey. And that is uh, approximately similar figures that have been found for Jordan, Israel, and Armenia. And so, especially in the Eastern Mediterranean, this genetic mutation is, um, seems a legacy of, of plague pandemics. Uh, to understand why the gene mutation that caused this disease occurred, it's necessary to look at plague outbreaks that affected Mediterranean societies for long centuries. In this case, the gene mutation that leads to the of Mediterranean fever usefully gives individuals resistance to your pestis, right? It genetically protects you from plague. Uh, this genetic mutation emerged as a kind of defense mechanism in societies that have been exposed to plague for many centuries. It continues to be passed down from generation to generation, even today, as an inherited genetic trait. But there is no plague in this part of the world anymore. But this genetic mutation still you know, uh, causes a, a condition uh, with people just living proof. I think you can think of this as a living proof of how the lived experience of a past disease transformed the immunological landscape of a society with ramifications for the present. So in a way, when we look at the legacy of past pandemics, we can either seek it in textual sources, and as historians, that's what we do. We reconstruct the past with our sources, 
In the case of past pandemics, it's also possible to uh, use material evidence, non factual sources, something like paleopathology, uh, paleogenetics can be uh, of help. But you know, even something, the existence of a, of a disease today, and especially in the Eastern Mediterranean, can be a living legacy of plague. I think I will conclude here because I think my time is up. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Maria. This was a fantastic presentation. So we've got events will be so on time, uh, which means we've got exactly. It means we've got some time for uh, questions. So if there are any questions for Lukic, our assistant, Giannis will go around with the mic. So I hope this doesn't put people off. They will have their mic in their hand. Any comments or any questions? I'm sorry, the lecture, you know, was more historiographical in nature than historical, but I'm happy to answer historical questions as well. <laughs> Okay, um, I hope it works. Uh, thank you so much, Chris, for the lecture. It was really fascinating, and um, I like your approach of uh, this um, pandemic spanning a long time. This was the impression I was brought when I informed myself. And um, I was wondering because you said uh, that sort of like uh, volcanic eruptions or earthquakes um, are like more punctual, like on point, but I think they are actually short this part in terms of. Pandemics because uh, volcanic eruption will also have long term consequences on nature, landscape, society. Or would you agree or maybe try to elaborate on that? That general this idea of pandemic studies should go into other studies as well. <laughs> maybe. A fantastic question. Thank you. In fact, now uh, there are recent works that uh, look at the, the effect of volcanic eruptions on pandemics. In fact, recently, some research suggested that both the Justinian plague and the Black Death had just before they um, happened, there were volcanic eruptions, just you know, preceding both. We don't know the exact mechanism by which a volcanic eruption may have triggered a global pandemic in the case of plague, but now there are some theories. I mean, one of them is that it's like the dust veil phenomenon that we have you know, heard about with the volcanic eruptions, the dust veil kind of blocking the sun rays, the UV rays. And so the decreased UV ray exposure to the world creating like, you know, anomalies in, in uh, precipitation patterns and um, agriculture and then, you know, uh, crops in other places causing drought or, um, Flooding. So we have some evidence that it may even have led to these plague pandemics. But even on their own, I think um, in the case of volcanic eruptions, there is more research about the long term um, ecological impact and how they kind of, you know, had an impact on human societies. In fact, there's also some research that looked at the um, relationship between Mongol invasions and volcanic eruptions. So I think there is new research looking at like rain patterns. And because as historians, you know, sometimes we can be too kind of like trapped in our texts, our sources, and perhaps sometimes forgetting about like, you know, what is going on in the natural world, right? Like, you know, how are temperatures or wind patterns or like whether there's food or water available or not. I mean, these are important circumstances that inform the thinking and the biological and ecological context for our historical actors, right? And sometimes, you know, we need to perhaps reconstruct those historical circumstances. But generally speaking, I gave that example uh, with respect to pandemic uh, disaster studies, because at least it's my impression that disaster studies, generally speaking, kind of cultivate that short-term approach 
um, which pandemic studies have kind of adopted or continued, but I see them as very different in terms of like how they should be treated. And in fact, the disaster studies approach and mostly like the those approaches that history, especially in the case of uh, history of pandemics, adopted from social sciences don't seem to work very well. At least, you know, that, that's my impression. Uh, but yes, there are some studies, especially like with uh, volcanic uh, eruptions, they're looking at their own term impact. Thank you for your question. Uh, the standard narrative that we give of the Black Death is coming on ships into the Mediterranean from the Black Sea and presumably from further east. But it's easy to see how this is a Eurocentric uh, Orientalist approach. Can you suggest another narrative that wouldn't have this kind of problem? Sure, I'm just checking to see if I have. Um, Monica Green is one of the historians who's been working on the history of the second pandemic, especially with the Black Death, trying to incorporate these um, like beyond your own narratives, especially looking at what's going on in Central Asia. Um, I would highly recommend her work, especially her recent article on uh, four Black Deaths that's been published at the American Historical Review alongside uh, with her other works. In fact, very significantly, what she's trying to uh, put together, I mean, there are, of course, other historians that I'd be happy to, to share references about, like, what is wrong with that narrative and where it needs to be fixed. And of course, there is some truth uh, to it in terms of, you know, circulation patterns, but also there is these limitations. Um, for example, the European Black Dots, because I think in the light of research coming from Monica Green and other researchers, we will now need to expand the time scale of the second pandemic by at least a century. So what is the standard narrative we have? Black that starts in like somewhere in you know Crimea, Northern Black Sea, uh, 1346 or so, and then it comes with Genoese ships to Europe, to Europe, right? That's kind of like the, the, the main uh, trajectory we know. Well, she has recently shown that the Black Death actually starts in the 13th century not the 14th century, right? Um, and in fact, trying to look at how um, the westward um, uh, movement of the Mongol armies may have involuntarily, inadvertently brought the plague with them. And in fact, new research again coming from the fall of Baghdad, the, the big siege of Baghdad by uh, Mongol armies in the year 1258 seems to have resulted in an outbreak of plague in Syria and Egypt in the 1260s. So we are extending the time frame of the second pandemic by at least a century, if not more. And maybe some of you may have seen recently there was some uh, paleogenetic um, uh, research that came out of Kyrgyzstan. Uh, from a cemetery and like every news channel in the world showed that as like the origin of the black that was found in fact you know the only thing that showed they showed that in a cemetery uh, two or three individuals you know died as a result of plague which was something that we already knew from archaeological sources so good to have the confirmation coming from science but it's not the origin of the black that i mean it's just you know how the media can sensationalize science that's another story but in a way, we're so obsessed with origins and narrative, we want to know exactly where it's coming from. We want to construct that timeline, like a neat timeline, it starts in one place and then it moves somewhere else. Like another problem with those narratives, generally speaking, that Plague somehow always knows that it needs to move west. Like how does Plague? Well, I mean, what I actually like about Monica Green's research is that she complicates that narrative, right? It's not moving in one direction. It's moving in many directions, but we're only one, picking up one historical narrative out of that, a narrative that kind of fits our general way of writing about history and talking about it. It fits our narratives. And again, we're still repeating 19th century discourses, in my opinion, 
And in fact, instead of adopting a more complex and more complicated story, we're just, you know, picking one there that we know to play moves west, right? Like also moves east, also north, also south at the same time. It is, it's, in fact, my own research um, looking at the Mediterranean world. This is this is what I like, like at least looking at the Eastern Mediterranean. It's moving in many directions, right? It's not only east to west, it's more complicated than it. And there are other parts of that narrative that, that's wrong, but I'm not gonna go into more details, but thank you for your question. <laughs> Yes, thank you very much for a fascinating talk. I'm, uh, I'm an IT student center historian, so uh, 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 I just wanted to ask uh, uh, about the play in China. Is there a bibliography about it? And also to connect with the previous uh, question, uh, uh, play as posing to ships, because uh, mice on ships are still uh, on board. Because they go uh, they come on the boats from one mm -hmm. ports, and so it's very easy to, to carry them. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right about like ships being just the main vector of transporting you know, basically rats, and then they uh, transmit the disease. That is correct, but that's more like how it spread in the 19th century or starting in the 19th century. But again, since the plague historiography starts in the 19th century. We kind of take that model and we project it to the past. And we want to think of always ships spreading it from like harbor city to port city to port city, and then play kind of creeping from port cities to the interior, to the interland. In fact, when we read late antique sources and medieval sources, we know that that's not necessarily always the case. Yes, in some cases, you have the introduction of the disease through maritime routes and through port cities. But not always necessarily in that pattern. Um, it's also important to look at the slow kind of progress of the disease in the local growth and colonies, right? Um, now, historians are working on multiple introductions of plague, for example, to Europe, one line just kind of like moving over land, one line from overseas. Even though the maritime story and the ships, that's more. That's more visible. That's more like easily documentable, right? That's how we want history to, to be. We want to have an origin. We want to have that story it's like it's spread from this city to this city. But in reality, when you look at the ecology of the disease, it's something that is more invisible and slowly progressing, right? Um, I didn't have a chance to talk much about it here, but rats are not even not the only. And in fact, they're not even the most important host to the disease because rats, just like us, they die uh, from plague, like we do. What you really need is a resistant host species, right? The animals, especially some uh, wild rodent species, will have that ability. They have the infection in their blood, but they don't get sick or they don't die as a result of it, which means they can be a host to it and they can be a reservoir reservoir species that they can uh, just basically make the disease stay in that environment uh, for long periods of time. And again, research tells us that even if the disease is not introduced from outside, the local rodent colonies can keep it alive for hundreds of years. So this narrative that we have, plague comes on board the ship and the rodents spread, it is not false, but it is only one way among many ways that plague can spread from one place to another. China, China is an interesting question, still under debate. So historians are, um, they, they're, they disagree. Uh, some historians believe that the Black Death was never, like never happened in China. Others say that it is. Um, so there are like two different uh, views. But um, so like, I believe most recent research is telling us that 13th century was also a time that, you know, it, it seems we have some evidence from Chinese sources, Chinese medical sources, that the Black that was also in China. Um, in the 1260s or so, in, in the court of uh, Kublai Khan and in the, in the, in the, in the Mongol court, there is evidence that uh, plague may have been there, but we need, yeah, I mean, Chinese historians and will have to will have to tell us because I don't read the sources that 
pretty much you know what I can say about it. But uh, there is still a more debate. Yeah, thank you for that talk. That was a good debate that you had. I like to work with the cartoons uh, you know, on the present uh, the last couple of years, obviously, and uh, it's kind of our, our cultural memory. I can take it back to the Black Death, to the Spanish flu, but to the Black Death perhaps a bit more uh, imaginatively. In the, in the 50, uh, 14th century in, in Europe, during the Black Death, in the European sources, mm -hmm. you don't get many references to the Plague of Justinian. They don't quite realize that this had happened before. In the, in the Islamic and Ottoman sources, do you, because Justinian Plague is more that area of the Mediterranean, do you see a kind of, you know, not cartoons, but do you see any kind of cultural memory of this has happened before and, you know, you remember this in a way, even though it's a long ago. Do you see that? Brilliant question. Yes. There's actually a new article coming out just on this. In fact, it's a volume that, uh, that you mentioned, Marianne Fancy uh, wrote an article on this one about the continuity of medical knowledge in the Islamic world between the first pandemic and the second pandemic, which does not exist in the Black West. So when the Black Death came, um, scholars in the Islamic world had access to earlier plague treatises and medical commentaries coming from the late antique and the uh, late medieval period, talking about plague as a disease and causing uh, pandemics. So this is not and how to treat them, what the symptoms were, what color were the peoples, where they were located, how it affected the human. So the medical knowledge was something that was still alive, modified perhaps in time, but it was there. In the Latin West, you don't see that. So um, Black Death, in every plague chronicle, plague uh, treatise that you see written like in Latin or in the in an vernacular European language, you start with the 14th century, you always have the sentence of this is the first time this is happening. It's, it's oh my god, this is the book of this is the first time the world never has seen anything like this. So that's the emphasis. So that's, I think, one of the major differences because that medical tradition continued, like in the textual uh, sources, continued in the Islamic world, but there was a complete break in, in, in Europe. Um, the other part of this that may also be interesting is that uh, there was no Justinianic plague or the first pandemic per se until, basically until the 20th century. So Black Death, yes, it was a defining for Botanana since the 19th century, so someone talked about it, but no one really talked about the first pandemic. Or, so even that the, the practice of naming them like first pandemic, second pandemic, third pandemic, only after the plague of Hong Kong, 1894, when it spread globally, like you have plague in San Francisco, in Johannesburg, in like you know, all of the like global cities, in, in India and whatnot. Then people talking about even the term pandemic is around the time that like even the term pandemic is this, you know coming to circulation at that time. It wasn't used before, like pandemic, something like global, the fact that many regions more than one continent, right? But the phenomenon, the shared experience of it is something that just you know be, be, became the mainstream uh, knowledge in, in medical uh, knowledge, sciences and epidemiology in that time period, right? But also the history of the disease develops after that time. But really, no one was, was talking about the first pandemic until then. It's just much like it's a 20th century construction. Um, so you have some historical accounts from the late antique period that chronicles and whatnot talking about, like you know, the plague of Justinian, but not thinking about it as an independent pandemic. And in fact, most of the like late antique and medieval sources always talk about plague as belonging to a specific place. Like you have uh, accounts about the plague of London, 1665, plague of Marseille, plague of this. But, so plague or like a disease is something that is thought belonging to a place, specific time and place. But the notion of pandemic is something that is like universal or global. This is more and more common. 
that 
the European and public health officials said about the Islamic world, like then you have the playbook Hong Kong in the colonial context, they say this exact same things for like China and India, right? And the, the, the colonial context, you know, you see how that body of knowledge being, you know, recycled. Um, when we look at playbook of San Francisco, then we see the same xenophobic and racist discourses being said of the yellow peril and like how Chinese immigrants, for example, were associated with disease, right? And still we see the continuation of those, you know, very dangerous discourses today. So I think there's something to be said about the long history of the associations or how disease becomes a racialized uh, phenomenon. But uh, we still don't know to this day. Okay. Thank you so much for your paper or for your lecture. Um, I wonder if there are any, uh, because we're discussing it as being a disruptive event or something that's happening. I wonder if there are any exceptions, that is, areas, places, spaces, cities within the sphere of the disease that somehow managed to not be affected by it. Some, some exceptions that stand out. Thank you for your question. I mean, usually the uh, city of Aon in the England is, you know, given as an exceptional story uh, because the locals were aware of the possibility of the introduction of the disease coming from others uh, outside. So they kind of set up, um, they, they took some precautions, right? So, um, but when, in fact, when we look at, um, there are also other um, examples, even though it's controversial, uh, for example, Poland, um, gentleman speaking the region, like seems to have been spared of the um, uh, black death, but it's also possible that we don't have enough um, you know, historical sources to support it, enough, uh, not enough data. But so we have some isolated is, is instances in which we see plague not introduced to a certain location. In fact, I think the case of Milan is also given as an example because it was spared, I think, from the black that when you call it got plague later on. But so the first introduction of the disease, and yes, if you, if you, if you somehow kind of block it, and it's if you don't get it the first time around, then it, it uh, you may be spared. But if you have rodent kind of colonies moving or other animals bringing it, so I guess my point was like you know you can take human pr protections to, to limit its introduction, uh, but you might still receive it by kind of more natural. Uh, means, but yes, like I think there are some exceptions. Um, so these are these are the ones that um, this occurred to me. Uh, yeah, but like I, I mean, to me, a more interesting question is: you may have precautions, but if an earlier introduced infection uh, might occur on its own or not. I mean, the question is. Do you, does the infection need to be introduced from outside each time in each epidemic outburst? Or is it something that is maintained in the local ecological context and it kind of erupts for reasons that we don't fully understand? That's kind of you know a question that maybe accompany uh, what you asked. Thank you. Thank you for your paper. I was just wondering. Um, I was just wondering whether we should use a longer approach when dealing with epidemics, or rather whether any event is a discrete one, because otherwise there is what they call the zoom to risk of just taking the out of war and saying, yes, this is the guide for edge fund management. We take the past collapses of society, and this is how we deal with it. Do you think that we should actually stop doing that and just say, we don't even know what those risks were, because we debate about that? Or do you rather think that there is a threat 
that things are going to be better. Yeah, no, I mean, I am very, uh, very opinionated about this. I think, especially about the party, emerging infectious diseases or re emerging infectious diseases, right? Um, so far, when you look at the history of emerging infectious diseases, the only disease that's been fully eradicated by human efforts is smallpox. And yes, very successful global coordinated you know, vaccination campaign globally in 1978 or 79, last, last case of human smallpox, and then you don't have smallpox in the world today, which is a success story. But let's also remember that smallpox has no other known animal host outside of humans. So if a disease is only hosted by humans, then yes, with a very rigorous vaccination campaign, you can, you can deal with it, right? Most other infectious diseases have also animal hosts. And when it is in the, especially in the wildlife population, they're almost impossible to eradicate. I mean, you can eliminate them, you can control them. And of course, we should always, you know, maintain good vaccination and public health pro programs. Uh, to you know to, to keep these uh, diseases in check, right? Infectious diseases. But once they're in the animal population, then they by definition they force us to think more human, right? In fact, I mean this was one of the controversies the very early days of the COVID-19 pandemic, before it went into the wildlife. I mean we're now in a forever pandemic. We will never eradicate COVID-19 from the world, right? The same is for plague. We will never eradicate your pestis from the world, right? And this also applies to many other uh, disease pathogens, disease agents. They change, over, they change over time, they mutate and they adapt and whatnot, but we will never eradicate. So in the case of your pestis, the bacterium that causes plague, we are talking about a at least 5,000 years of history. Right now, we know this not from historical sources, but um, this applies to the prehistoric period, but we know this from uh, paleogenetics research, right? Um, this disease has been causing epidemics for the last 5,000 years. How else you can study the history of a disease that affected human societies for at least the last 5,000 years, right? So for me, that's the only way out. Just, you know, I mean, not only for historical study, but also as, as a public health understanding in, in, in the popular understanding of disease. And I think if everyone in the world had a better understanding of what we were getting into in the beginning of this pandemic, perhaps, you know, we would have responded differently instead of thinking about, oh, this is something that's just gonna, you know, affect us for a few weeks and it's gonna go away. And more than two years into it, we're still in it, we're in that forever pandemic. Right? So I absolutely think that we need to have a long-term uh, approach to studies through pandemics. I'm going to take one last question before we conclude. Uh, I'm like some, I don't know if this is a new question. The youngest uh, that will be in the real one. Um, already learned quite a bit from you, obviously, being your son. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, you're talking earlier about how some larger animals who could um, uh, stay alive with the um, plague inside them could um, essentially keep the virus, the plague, in an area um, because of uh, how they will die from it and they'll keep. <laughs> and the. Sorry. Okay, okay not larger animals, but yeah, wild groups, yes. Oh, I thought you were saying larger animals. Oh, well, I guess. Um, so, going to ask would animals um, like cattle mm -hmm. or um, deer or animals like that? Um, to track the virus and give it to people when people uh, hunt them or eat them for meat? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, excellent question. Thank you. <laughs> yes, more than 200 species of mammals, including large mammals, can be infected with plague and 
can contract the disease and can give it to other people, but they are not efficient hosts, which means that they die as a result of the disease, or they're just not very efficient in giving it to others, right? Um, channels can be actually effective. In fact, people do get plague out of eating camel meat, and this is something that's been documented recently in Saudi Arabia and also in, the, in the Algeria and Tunisia. So eating camel meat, but most of the time it's rodents. Um, occasionally you hear on the news of um, improperly cooked uh, rodent meat. Apparently it's a delicacy in Central Asia, gerbil, uh, uh, mar marmot, marmot and gerbil uh, meat. Uh, marmot barbecue can give you plague, so don't eat it. If you travel to, to Central Asia, if they offer you marmot meat, I'm like, no, thank you. So that's a practical thing to remember. <laughs> thank you. And I think the advice <laughs> we would like to thank once again, Lucas, for the fantastic. <laughs> Well, before we have to dinner, where promise does not come on it, uh, sir. Uh, just a reminder, I know you might have received the email, but perhaps you didn't check the time for the bus tomorrow morning if you're going 